Take your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Matthew chapter number 5, Matthew chapter number 5. We're going to get started right here. I'm excited about the message tonight. And what a good crowd. By the way, this is the this first week or second week we've had Patch the Pirate Club out there. And uh, boy, praise God for our patch workers, the Solanos, Mrs. Hudson, and uh, the Grossarts. And boy, they're a blessing. And the kids being there, we have a bunch of them over there. And I love the kids of the church. I'm thankful for that program. But this is a good Wednesday night crowd. I'm excited. God knew we needed this tonight. Tonight's message is going to be entitled, A Practical Guide to Being a City Set on a Hill. A Practical Guide to Being a City Set on a Hill. And sort of introduce this, it's uh, an interesting. We are meant to be lights. We're meant to be a city that is set on a hill. We're not to hide it under a bushel. We're not to hide our Christian lives under a bushel. No, we're to let our light shine to a lost and dying world. And uh, a couple of things, that city set on a hill. When I visited uh, Israel, the region of Galilee, uh, probably six or seven years ago with my wife, we're down at the uh, Sea of Galilee, and Pastor Reynolds uh, looked up and he said, see, up there Jesus was talking about the city that was set on a hill and it brought the Bible to life because that city, there's no way it could possibly be hid. There in Galilee, you look north toward Mount Hermon, there's that city. It's impossible for it to be hid. It's there. And we as Christians, we need to let our light shine into a lost and dying world. When I was 18 years of age, not saved, not living for the Lord, uh, I was working at a, a grocery store. I, I bagged groceries. How many of you bagged groceries when you were younger? Some of you, not very many of you. Oh, you did, Brother Jordan. Uh, you both did. That's where you met. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. And uh, praise the Lord. I used to have sort of a, a competition with my, my mind a little bit. I'd look at the items that were being scanned, and I'd try to guess the total price. Did you ever do that? Yeah, you did a little bit. No, 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 no. That's not what but anyways, uh, I remember as I was bagging groceries, at the very end, this guy said, thank you. And then he gave me a little thing. He said, I'd like you to have this. And I took that piece of paper, and I didn't think much about it. I put it in my pocket. It, but I do remember a little bit later on, I had uh, my living my parents. I, I ended up left my, my parents' while school. I apartment upstairs. It was a terrible place to live, uh, grass, and it was just a dirty, nasty place, and uh, it was just my pocket, and I sat in, and began to look at it, and it was a gospel track with the plan of salvation, and it had sort of fill, fill in the blank little things, and I, I remember reading through that thing, and I remember the back of it had the sinner's prayer, and I remember getting on my knees on a chair, and I, I read through that prayer. Now... I don't know if that's the time I got saved, but I, I do know that that made an impact. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And actually, after I trusted Christ my Savior, I finalized it further. I found that gospel track. I've got it somewhere uh, where I'd filled it out. And, and I just thought that one man who I, I won't see until I get to heaven made an impact in my life by giving me the scripture. And, and praise God, he was a city that was set on a hill. Praise the Lord for that. And uh, boy, praise the Lord. When you look at this, this is the Sermon on the Mount. And let's do this in honor of God's word. If we can, stand for the name of God's word. And what we'll read together in unit number 13, 16, ready. Let's try this together. Ye are the salt of the earth, but the salt of the lost is Said henceforth, it's not. It's it's he, thenceforth. Let's start over. You're just you're, you're all messing up, and I, I just uh, we need to get this right before we go further. That's going to be a rough night. Start over. Here we go. Verse number thirteen. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. 
and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Oh boy, that verse 14. Ye are the light of the world. Ye are the world. saved, are they not? Boy, we're the light. If we don't share the light of the glorious gospel and give them gospel, who is? In other words, it's a practical guide to being a city set on a hill. I'm going to give you some practical truths, practical ways that you and I can get out the gospel in a, in a wonderful, practical manner. Before we go any further, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the good people here tonight that are interested in being cities that are set on a hill. And Lord, I'm thankful for the, the folks that are consistent in this. They are cities set on the hill and they go everywhere giving the gospel. And uh, Lord, I pray that you help them to continue on for years. I do pray that you help us as a church grow stronger in that area. Help us to not just go soul winning, but be soul winners. Help us to not just at one time be a missionary, but, but boy, live our life as missionaries, Lord. I pray that you help tonight's message. It's biblical. We love you and we need you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. In this first passage, verse 13, ye are the salt of the earth. Verse 14, ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be held. Let your light so shine before men. In other words, first point to the sermon is we, we're, we are light. Amen. We are that city that is set on a hill. Boy, we are light. How, how many have been saved by the blood of the crucified one? Amen. Boy, yes, amen. That's wonderful. How many of you love the Lord? How many of you love the Lord? Amen. Of course we do. How many of you love the King James Bible? Amen. I do. Yes, we do. Of course we do. We are the light of the world. The world has no hope outside the, the word of God, Jesus Christ. And they, they can't get the gospel without Christians uh, being that light of the world, giving amen. the gospel to a lost and dying world. Boy, we were here Saturday, and we had soul winning on Saturday, and all oh, the bus meeting on Saturday, and uh, Brother Paul Sinerka was here, and uh, we began to talk, and uh, I, one of my sons didn't know the first time I met Paul Sinerka, but Paul Sinerka gave a testimony to my son and me, and I forgot about it, but here we go, Paul in the Navy, he'd been saved as a kid, and he was uh, in Groshond Hall on the Norfolk Naval Base, and he had been uh, walking over to the commissary and the Navy Exchange right there. And somebody uh, met him and uh, gave him a ride back to Groshan Hall and invited him to a church. And uh, he was all excited. He called his dad and he told him the name of the church or the type of church. And his dad said, hey, you got to be careful. You got to be careful. You don't want to go to a church that teaches false doctrine and, and uh, a different way to heaven. And But Paul was all excited about that. He, he was there at the Groshan Hall and there I was newly married and uh, I had uh, my van. It was an Astro van and my Astro van, every door other than the passenger or the, uh, the, front, uh, the front driver's door was broken. And our sliding door right there, we had to take a wire and wire it shut right there. And so I remember going over to Groshan Hall that morning. I was looking for somebody to come to church and I had a route where I picked people up. And as I was walking up there, Paul was coming out and he thought I was the other person picking up for the other church. And I said, you ready for church? And he got in. And I strapped him in and I wired him shut. And uh, uh, then, then all of a sudden we're driving to this and I mentioned the church that we're going to and all of a sudden he's real, I'm going to the wrong church. But he wasn't going to the wrong church. He was going to the right church. And uh, God used that. And boy, what a wonderful family he is. Uh, him and his wife, Sarai, a wonderful part of our orchestra, bus ministry, their children, just children, they're having baby number two coming up. And glory be to God for that. Hey, we are light. We are light. You are light. I am light. Then if you look back, we need to realize, verse 13, ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing. We need to realize that people need you. People need Amen. me to be that salt. People need us to be that light. 
Boy, in the time of Jesus, all around, uh, in every city, every town, in every village, from Jerusalem to Capernaum, the Jews, the Gentiles, the Romans, the Ammonites, the Samaritans, they desperately needed the Lord. And Jesus went everywhere to be that uh, the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. And, and I, I was thinking of, about a song they played at the revival, but it, it's a, a well-known song every day. They pass me by. Now think about this. Every day, they pass me by. I can see it in their eyes. Empty people filled with care, headed who knows where. On they go through private pain, living fear to fear. Laughter hides their silent cries. Only Jesus hears. The title of the song, People Need the Lord. Amen. People need the Lord. At the end of broken dreams, He's the open door. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. When will we realize people need the Lord? Amen. We are called to take His light to a world where wrong seems right. What, what could be too great a cost for sharing life with one who's lost? Through His love, our hearts can feel all the grief they bear. share then the end of it, people need the lord people need the lord at the end of broken dream door people need the lord boy on that bus and uh, we were driving and i'd suggested brother uh, jay hudson stop at a gas station right outside of suffolk but he knew of another place that was slightly outside of franklin and i remember him pulling that bus out over at that gas station and your brother jay's driving like this and swerving in there and he gets out the flood of people go out of there and uh there wow we we cleaned out that store with goodies and all that stuff it was great and uh, I got a big old pack of gum for my kids, watermelon gum, and they're chewing gum. And we're going up to pay for it. And I see the guy's name. His name is uh, Bishop. And I said, hey, Bishop. Uh, I said, boy, we need a bishop to come to the church that I'm a part of and preach. Are you a preacher? And he looked at me with a, a funny eye right there. And like, I didn't even really smile right there and sort of added. I gave him an invitation to church. And the split moment that I have, I flipped it over and, and said, hey, the Bible way to heaven it seemed very, very disinterested. Now, me and my wife stayed after the service that night. We had a, a dinner with Brother uh, Treber and some of the, the staff at the church right there. And so we were driving home at, uh, way into the hours of night and uh, we pulled over at that same gas station. And uh, as we're in the gas station, we uh, used the restroom and came out of there and said, Hey, Bishop, you remember me? And it's like, <laughs> like quivered a little bit right there and uh so we went to the, the revival again last night we stopped by the same gas station again and guess who was working again now i feel bad he wasn't very receptive but without a doubt it breaks your heart because behind that young man's heart and behind his face uh, is a hurt heart. He desperately needs the Lord whether he knows it or not. The only hope for him is Jesus Christ. And, you know, he may be that 18-year-old that that guy gives him a gospel track and he goes home and he puts it down and he begins to read it and he gets on his knees and he begins to ask the Lord to say, we don't know. Right. Well, I was in the same situation not, uh, not, not, a, not a really long time ago. <laughs> Feels like a couple days ago, but it's a long time ago now. But you understand, people need the Lord. People need the Lord. And then this right there, verse 14. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Then verse 16, and this is sort of a, a shout. Uh, let, your, let your light so shine before men. Amen. Let your light so shine before men. Jesus is there on that Sermon on the Mount. And he's still, hey, ye are the light. Shine the light. Amen. Shine the light. Amen. Shine the light. Boy, you, you think about that. You ever gone camping with like, kids? And so often our kids, we've gotten our kids the uh, light that goes on their forehead right there. And the kids get excited about flashlights and lights. And, you know, it gets dark outside. They turn that on. And then they <laughs> look at you. And they like, hi, Dad. And it's blinding you. Oh. And uh, turn off that light. 
And uh, they'll turn it off, but the next day they forget. And they, it spends like half the camping trip. You're getting shined by that bright light killing your eyes. And, uh, but in reality, we need to shine our go. And uh, it, it was a story of Tom Wallace and the churches that he pastored. And the goal of those churches was to get out the gospel, then win people to Christ, and then bring them under the Bible, uh, Bible-believing church and teaching the Bible. And uh, I went with Tom Wallace when he was preaching here. I went to breakfast with him and one of his friends from years ago, Brother Carl Bieber. And uh, we were sitting there in a hotel, and we had breakfast together. And at the end of the thing, Brother Tom Wallace is walking away, and there was a lady who was cleaning off the tables. And uh, Brother Wallace looked at her and he said, hey, I'd like to just thank you. I'd like to thank you for cleaning up and being a blessing. And I, I want to give you this. And he took out a gospel track and he gave it to the lady. And then he said, look at this. On this gospel track, it shows you something very important. It shows you how you can be sure that you go to heaven when you die. And, and the lady was interested. Can I show you that? And he went through the gospel and I was amazed. He went there and showed her that she was a sinner. According to the Bible, she was destined to die and go to hell to pay for her sins. But praise God, the good news is Jesus Christ loves her and cares for her and died on the cross for her sins. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And then the very end, he looked, he said, wouldn't you like to trust Christ as your savior? Joseph, you were there with me. And, and next thing you know, she said, I would. And she bowed her head and trusted Christ as her savior. And what was impressive about that He's 90 years of age, tired, a little bit older than all of us, amen? But he's never lost that zeal of being a light in a dark world. Amen. And he's learned that wherever he goes, he can shine the light to a lost and dying. He lets his light shine. He lets his light shine. Now, I'm going to give you some practical things in a moment, but you have to understand, we are light. Amen. People need the light. Yes, We're to let our light shine. But it, it, the, the practical things don't matter if we're not going to be lights. Yes, sir. So we are lights. Amen. We're to be that city on a set on a hill. Right. Uh, people need the light. We're to let that light. So what can I do practically speaking? I want you to turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And as you're going there, you, you find the truth of the giving out the gospel throughout the scriptures. I, I love Acts chapter 4, the persecution that came to Peter and, and John. And, uh, boy, they're told, well, they're commanded not to speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus. And then Peter answered unto them, and in 24, we cannot speak the things which we've seen and heard. He said, you're telling me not to say anything. You're threatening us, but we can't help but speak the things we've seen. What, what do you expect us to do? He's the Savior. He's the, the Lamb of God which taken away the, the sin of the world. In Isaiah chapter 58, verse 1, cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Then 1 Corinthians gives us some practical thoughts because here we are. I know I'm a light. I know people need the light. I know I need to shine the light. But inside we're trembling and scared. Pastor can. Uh, brother, brother Chris heaps can. Brother Randy, he's got a voice. Oh, he definitely, it's his job right there. It's Brother Randy's job. Brother Mike Nolan's job. Absolutely, absolutely. But in reality, it's all of our job. That's right. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17, it says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, Amen. not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none of them. The gospel is not your, the power is not in your words, it's in the word of God. And it's so important. I can't because I'm inadequate. We're all inadequate. Yes, we all can't. We all struggle. We all have problems. But, but it goes, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Of course it is. <laughs> you folks that go out and try to tell people about Jesus, what in the world are you doing? Uh, why in the world would you go out on a Thursday or those ladies that go out on Tuesday? Or why would you have a church that goes out on a Saturday? Come on, loading up in a couple of buses. It makes no sense. It's, it's foolish for, for somebody who's perishing, somebody who's dying going to hell. It makes no sense for you to go out and try to tell somebody about Jesus Christ. But it says this, but unto us, which are saved, it is the power of God. Amen. 
There's nothing better this side of eternity than for a Christian to go out and be a, a witness for Christ. Amen. Tell people about Jesus Christ. Try to give the gospel to somebody. In, in verse 23, but we preach Christ crucified. Then verse 25, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And, and it begins, there's a battle between oh, doing it, knowing where it's right and actually doing it and not doing it. We know we should, but there's the battle inside. And it's saying, hey, knock it off. Getting the gospel has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with him. Amen. It's not your power, not by your might, not by your, but it's all in the power of God. And then it says in verse 31, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Amen. The, 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 the soul winning or being a missionary, it's not about us getting glory and us getting a pat on the back. It's about pointing them to the one who deserves it. Amen. Boy, uh, Revelation chapter 4, uh, where uh, they begin to bow. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they all were created. Thou art worthy. And then we get to this text, look at chapter 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And the, let's look at a couple of verses here. Look at this. My brethren, Apostle Paul, one of the great Christians of all time, and my brethren, when I came to you, not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto the you the testimony of God. He said, it wasn't my speech, it wasn't my wisdom when I came to you. Verse two, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. I just tried my best to, to tell you about Jesus. Verse three, and I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power yes, sir. of God. Amen. Why was that given to us? Why, why did God in his infinite wisdom have the apostle Paul write that section in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, chapter 2? Because he knew we needed it. What did we need? We needed to remind the importance of being a light. And then we needed to be reminded that it's not our wisdom, our words, our excellency that we need, which we need God. What can we do practically speaking? And uh, I... In a, in a quick nutshell, I, I've journeyed to the point where I'm a pastor now. I try to be a witness, but I, I remember the first time somebody challenged me to be a witness. I was uh, on a Sunday afternoon, and somebody said, hey, we should go out and try to tell somebody about the Lord. Will you go? Sure, as long as I don't have to talk. Okay. And they lied to me. <laughs> but they went out there, and there was a kid by the, the park bench right there, and he said, uh, and the guy talked to him, gave him an invitation to church, and then asked him if you knew if you'd go to heaven when he died. And then he handed it over to me, and, and I was trembling in fear, tried my best to give the gospel to him. I remember getting excited about trying to tell people about the Lord, so I, I tried going to downtown Chicago. I heard of people street preaching. And so I went to down, downtown Chicago, and there was a drunk that followed me and my, a couple of my friends around, and we, we preached at the car. None of them got saved. But we tried. I didn't know what I was doing. Then I found there was a tra waiting for a train, and they had nothing to do. So I spent hours, best as I could, trying to talk to those people and try to tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm just going to say, a lot of them listened, a lot of them didn't listen. And right there, I didn't know exactly what to say. I just tried my best to tell them about Jesus Christ. Uh, sunshine ministry and there was a bus ministry that I, I joined and we'd go out every Saturday and we would try to tell people about the Lord the military and uh, the, the Walmart brother uh, Gray and Mrs. Gray we got the, the time when the Walmart allowed us for that but you're you're passing those out you're trying to tell people about the Lord and uh, boy Grace Baptist Temple at that time and uh, the devil will be mad if you go. And then somebody called the police on, on you and your brother, Benjamin, uh, passing those out. We've had a lot. They thought there was a, a satanic protest against our church, just a campaign. <laughs> they really did. And so the, the police came after my sons. And uh, yeah, that was a bad day. And so what I told them is that, yeah, they're devil worshipers. <laughs> I didn't do that. I didn't do that. Felt like it sometimes, though. Okay. So we get this, first of all, 
I, I go soul winning. Okay, I go soul winning. And, but there's a difference between I go soul winning and being a soul winner. Yes, sir. Yes. And praise God for go. And I mentioned this on Sunday. Praise God for scheduled times of going soul winning. Yes, sir. We ought to. I think it's good. But but more importantly, not just go to the importantly, not just go to the scheduled times. Be a soul winner uh, at times of missionary or be a missionary. And so, in other words, there are scheduled times to go. I said tomorrow night, five thirty. I'm here at the church. A bunch of men that are. Here. We're gonna load up. We're gonna go somewhere. And we're gonna try to ask people about the Lord. And sometimes it doesn't work exactly like we think. Last. Thursday, when you men went, the, the band didn't have gas. And so you guys stopped at a gas station. Brother Jack Bray got out. Uh, Brother Jack, you're back there. You and Eric Miller got out. And uh, I bet everybody got out of the gas station. You guys went into the gas station, and somehow you began to give the gospel to somebody, and they got saved, Amen. which I think was amazing. Brother Jack, you back there? You asleep? Did that really happen? Yes, sir. So... Praise the Lord. When you, when you schedule it, what, what gets scheduled gets done. Right, and so when you schedule things, I mean, imagine if you never scheduled the work. <laughs> imagine if we never scheduled a church service, we never have church. And so sometimes we need to schedule times to go. As a church, I am extremely thankful for our super Saturday of soul. It's the first Amen. Saturday of the month. We have a bunch of you come out. We, we usually get two buses. going to be awesome. And, you know, when we schedule that, you know, I've got always open the door, and I thank you for that speaking. Super Saturday this morning uh, on a bus, and another son of my most were out there, and we traveled, and the first thing, there was a yard sale going on. And so I went in there and I began to talk to the people that were in the yard sale. There was a guy named Jeff, and he had this, uh, two of these Volkswagen bug model cars that are really nice and he gave them to my sons and I tried to talk to him about the Lord really shut me down a little bit and uh, so I moved on I, but I talked to that Jeff and I forgot about that and then uh, we went and tried to talk to people and one of the last doors we were about to knock on the door lady opens the door she's smiling and she'd heard about our church having a revival and she talked to us and she came to church two Sundays ago she was going to be here this last Sunday but there was sickness and she'll, she'll be back and then this last Sunday um, well, that, a week ago, last Friday, that Jeff guy, I forgot about him, came banging on my door. And my door, I live in the neighborhood right there, and I forgot who he was. He said, Pastor, you were a Jeff. And I said, oh, I can't church on Sunday. So from that set, I saw one in. What do you Lord for two people come to church? Bless you, because it's scheduled. When you schedule things, it gets done. And, uh, but here's, here's the thing. Be a missionary. Wherever you go, try your you go, try your best to be a missionary. Here's the final thoughts. Carry these things. Amen. Amen. This has information for our church, then it has the gospel pre presentation on the back. So everywhere you go, boy, and here's a couple of approaches, okay? Now, I know everybody in here, your favorite restaurant is McDonald's. So when you go to McDonald's through the drive-thru, like I do all the time, I'm, that's why I, I do all the time, go to McDonald's, you, you get you a nice cup of coffee, and when you're done with that, yeah, amen, coffee right there. You go in there and you got two windows. You got the first window and you say, hey, thank you. You say, thank you. Say th those two words with me. Amen. Thank you. And so I say, thank you. It's a blessing. Uh, I want to give you this little booklet right here. I personally say this little booklet that I wrote. You say, hey, my pastor wrote this book and it tells you how you can go to heaven and die. And then sometimes very hard to drive through and carry the conversation out. But you try your best to do that. And right there, if you go to McDonald's, you get one, two done, two tracks out, just like that. Say the words thank you. So just be thankful. Amen. Okay, be thankful. Wherever you go, you're thankful. This is the thank you approach. You have somebody, the cashier at the grocery store, hey, thank you for bagging my groceries. I want to give you this. Uh, boy, thank you for holding that door for me. I want to give you this. Uh, thank you for taking my money. I want to give you this. Uh, whatever, whatever it is. Well, that's, that smells like good coffee. Thank you for that. 
but you look for to be thankful. It, it, as soon as you say thank you to somebody out there, it's an open door to giving out a book. Amen. So learn to look, somehow look to say thank you. Amen. Look for somebody to say thank you. Thank Amen. you. Thank you. Um, that, that's important. Thank you. It's a compliment approach. Uh, you, you compliment people. We went out to uh, lunch the other day. And uh, on the way into the restaurant there, I'm going to open the door for me. And I understand you open the door for me. So I said, man, you make a good door opener. I hire you at our church as being our door opener. Here, uh, I want to give you this. I showed him this. I gave it to him. And what is the end of the restaurant right there? He, he left. But then I'm, I'm in line over there ordering. And all of a sudden, he comes back in the door. And he comes and stands and he's sort of staring at me. And he's looking at me. And I didn't know if he's going to order. He said, hey, did we forget something? He'd gotten an order there. And he said, did you forget? He says, no. And I didn't realize he wanted to talk to me. Amen. So after I ordered, I made it very apparent. I went over there and opened up a conversation. He had a question about our church and this he's going through. And I tried to show him the gospel right there. And he sort of closed the door down. But I got his phone number. He uh, is busy the next two weeks. He's supposed to come three weeks uh, to our church. And then I said, after you come here, we're going to sit down because, and I explained to him a little bit about our church being a conservative, Bible-believing church and different things like that. You know what? At, at 443, I, I haven't talked to him, but at 443, I didn't text him. Guess what he did this afternoon? He texted me. He's going to be our church not tomorrow. But what that happened, it, it started with him holding the door. I said, you make a good door open for the dumb. It's not wisdom of words. In my gospel track right now. Amen. And so you, you look for thank you. you, look for you look, what about this? I would like to invite you approach. Somebody standing next to you in line at a store or at work. You have one of these, hey, I would like to invite you to the church I go to. It is good. I got a really good pastor. Why is everybody laughing? At us? Like if you really meant that, what are you laughing for? That's not good right there. I got a great pastor, Brother Randy, a great pastor. Amen. Uh, we got great music. We got wonderful nursery. And boy, we got a great thing going on here. Amen. Amen. We got Ryan Hatfield. Amen. Man, <laughs> just that right there will get a thousand people here. Yeah. Brother Ryan Hatfield, after the sermon, like I think Sunday night, he just looks at me and he starts going like this. do is just say, hey, I want to I want to invite you. I'd like to invite you. And then this right here, I, this is a, a, you can use anything to initiate a conversation. Whenever I see somebody with a football hat, Cowboys, no matter what it is, I like the Cowboys though. I don't like Cowboys. But I like it when they wear Cowboys. I said, hey, you're a Cowboys fan. Yeah. And as soon as they say that, they love to talk. They love to talk. They do. They're all... Cowboys fans, they're always loud. They're always a little bit stupid. Just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. It's only the Eagles fans and the Tampa Bay fans. That, uh, all right. But anyway, as soon as you see that hat, I, especially the Cowboys fan, I say, hey, I'd like to give you an invitation to our church, and it would be a great place for you because we accept sinners in our church. I've said that a hundred times and every time they laugh and then I explain about the pastor that was before me who used to love the Dallas Cowboys and how he brought dirt from Dallas for his grandchildren to be born under. The first thing I did as a church pastor is stomp the Dallas Cowboy trash can and throw it in the trash can. But, but listen, it's not about the Dallas Cowboys or anything like that. It opened a door to talk to them and I've given the gospel. Just, I'd like to invite you. Are you a Cowboys fan? And then th there's a thousand. You just think of using your personality wherever you're at to try to do it. Amen. And sometimes you just hold one out sometimes. Yeah. You don't have to say anything. Then here, here's what the next step is. Th th this is a conversation start. Right. Yes, this is a conversation start. And I want to just dwell on this for two minutes. A conversation start. 
some people are interested in the gospel. And those conversations naturally lead to me presenting the gospel. I, I can't Amen. count on my hands or my toes I, 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 the, how many times I've presented the gospel and people are interested. I mean, I, could, I mean, thousands. And I, I'm not, not saying that bragging, but thousands of people I've, I've gone through the gospel. Thousands. Yes, sir. Through the years. There's so many people that are interested. They just, it just, not, but I don't force people to listen to me. There are many people that just don't have time. They don't care. And if they don't care, they don't have time. I don't have time for them either. Right. Right. But, but the thing is, a lot of people do care. A lot right. of people are interested. Yeah. It, 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 every week, it seems like, every month, there's people that listen. So you, you look for this to turn over to give them the gospel, Amen. and you take it as far as you can go. There are some people who are ready to get saved, and they're low-hanging fruit. There's been a, a praying grandma or a family. Some people just want to hear, and it's sowing a seed. You're planting along in water, but eventually God will give the increase. So wherever that conversation goes, you're not responsible. You're responsible for best you can to give the gospel. You shouldn't put the pressure on yourself that you have to give them. Your job, your job to, to sow that seed, and as best as you can, like the Apostle Paul almost persuades out of me of a Christian, you're passionate about it, but in the end, they have to choose. Amen. You have to choose. Now, I'm saying that not to give a cop out and say nobody gets saved. People get saved all the time. Yes, sir. Right. They just do. But right. the, the point B is somebody will get caught up and say, well, I won't even get caught up on that. Allow the conversation just to go where it goes. Amen. You try your best. Now, sometimes there are people who are interested in arguing. Now, when, when, when I mean by this is there's been many people who were of a different uh, persuasion of works salvation or uh, they have just a cult religion that has nothing to do with the Bible and they want to argue. Now, I don't, I've spent some good long time pointing to the Word of God. And, I, and, I, and you can do it differently, but I, I've spent hours with Jehovah Witnesses before and where I'm leading the conversation of I plainly from the Bible that this is contrary to the Bible and in the end they're not Bible believers or Bible doubters. And it's led to me going to the Jehovah Witness Kingdom Hall, sitting down with some of the leaders that are inside the Kingdom Hall and talking to them for hours. I don't think that's wasted. I think it is prof profitable. I think they're going to stand before God. Uh, but I, I show them the Bible, the Bible, the Bible, the Bible, the Bible. Most of those conversations are with me in control, pointing to the Bible. Now, if you can't take control of a conversation, I understand that. Be careful of that. Because sometimes the false gospel people will control the conversation and they'll lead you into falsehood. I, I don't allow that. I sit down. Let's talk. <laughs> and uh, how, how many times a Mormon or a Jehovah Witness has sat on my, my front porch in a rocking chair and I've given them the gospel? I, I think that's good. Uh, you don't have to do that, but I, I, I do that. Then, for praise the Lord, just do it. Amen. It's the end right there. As best you can, be lights. Amen. Best you can, go out and tell somebody about the Lord. Amen. Best you can, pass these out. The challenge this month is for all of us to be missionaries. That's our church challenge for October. Now, think, think with me. This is the end of it. I'm seven minutes over what I normally... Eight minutes. Why did you have to turn as soon as I looked at it? Eight minutes over. And what I want you to do is I, I want some of you, I'd like all of you to commit with me to be a missionary for the month of October. I want you to commit that. Is that what God wants? Yes. yes. Ye are the light of the world. Amen. A city that is set in a hill cannot be hid. Right. And so think about it. I, I want some of you to join me and commit with me that do your best. Grab these gospel booklets, bunches of them, and take them out and hand them out like water for the month of October as best you can. And you know what? When you do that and you ask God, please help me, he's going to tell you, it's not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ be of none effect. And he'll say, lo, I am with you always, even in the end of the world. Amen. And he'll help you. And you know what we'll see of this? We'll see a bunch of miracles. Amen. We'll see you and me stronger in our faith. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we love you. We need you. And Lord, without a doubt, we can be, we should be witnesses. We should be light, Lord. I believe this month we'll see souls get saved. I believe that we'll see some Christians be stronger in you. Lord, uh, our church, I believe, will be stronger. We'll see more 
under the preaching of your word. And uh, boy, there'll be souls bound for heaven because they got saved. Lord, I pray that you help the, the people that are strong in this area to continue down that path. I pray that some folks that are here that have been maybe on the edge, jump on in. Lord, I pray that you help, Lord. Every head bowed and every eye closed, just want to ask you a couple questions. How many of you, by the raising of your hand, would commit with me to be a missionary in the month of October? How many of you say, I'm going to give it a whirl? I'm going to try. Raise your hand, if you will. You do it. Amen. Man, hands up all over. That's praise the Lord. That's 99% of the people. Praise the Lord. Put those hands down. Put those hands down. How many of you ask like this, though, and say, Pastor, ha, I'm going to, and I raised my hand, and maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you, you said, I, 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 I'm going to, but I'm scared half to death. Please pray for me. If that's you for raising your hand, please pray for me. Okay. That's a lot of people, and that's okay. And uh, praise the Lord. Put that down. Uh, and I believe if you pray, and I'll be praying for you, and then you just try it. Boy, if you just try, you pray and you try, God will help you. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for, boy, 98, 99% of the people. Thank you, Lord, for that. What a, a joy. What a blessing, Lord. Lord, probably 50% raised their hand saying, I'm scared. And uh, boy, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm scared still. Some almost 28 years later, Lord. But I pray that you help us to realize, boy, not to... The fear of man bringeth a snare. Help us to be strong in you. Help us to overcome that fear. Help us to, to go out and really turn from that fear and be strong in you, Lord. Lord, I pray that you bless. We love you in Jesus' name.